big fan of Frida myself. And uh, it was really such an honor to be asked to be here to talk about Frida Kahlo. And uh, just giving you a little bit of background on myself and my background with Frida Kahlo, I actually was the in-house curator for a museum uh, exhibition that we had at the North Carolina Museum of Art a couple of years ago that traveled to us about 2019 that highlighted Mexican modernism, which was of course a, a major art historical period which spans from 1920 into the 1950s. And I think for many people, this period is really best known for centerpiecing big murals by people like Diego Rivera, who you see, of course, on the screen here. And the seminal, these seminal examples of public art in the Americas in the 20th century. And of course, it's also the period in which Frida worked alongside Diego and of her own accord. And so it was really our experience at the NCMA that it was these two big names who really led the show. And I like to tell people that if we're going to be really honest about it, it was really more that it was one of these two artists who really packed the galleries in, in Raleigh. And that of course was Frida. I like to think that Frida is pretty much everywhere these days. She's really surrounded us because she's all over the place on t-shirts, on tattoos and tote bags. And she's been commodified to like the nth degree and she's also a really perennially popular Halloween costume. And even the likes of Beyonce can't resist dressing up or dressing in a way that's inspired by Frida. And it isn't rare to see these uh, costume contests, Frida Kahlo costume contests that are being held all over the world. And in fact, I thought this was really interesting. The Dallas Museum of Art actually entered into the Guinness Book of World Records in the summer of 2017 when they held the largest gathering of Frida Kahlo lookalikes ever. And it involved more than 1,000 men, women, and children dressing up as the artist. So Frida today is for sure one of the most famous and most beloved artists in the world. And even if you don't know her name, you know her face. So during the run-up of the exhibition at the North Carolina Museum of Art, we did some on the ground you know, research, market research to determine potential interest in this show where we would meet with, in many cases, younger audience members. Visitors would come in to see exhibitions or our permanent collection. And several people had no idea who Frida Kahlo, quote unquote, was. So I was saying that when we were at the North Carolina Museum of Art, uh, it was really interesting to see that people had no idea sometimes when you would say, do you know who Frida Kahlo is? That they wouldn't know or recognize the name but the moment that I showed an image, one of her self-portraits, people immediately would say, oh yes, of course, oh yeah, I know her. And that was really rather interesting and very exciting. And what's truly fascinating to me is that the idea of this obsession with Frida, um, sometimes people call it Frida mania, or I think Frida mania, if you're speaking with a more appropriate Spanish accent, apologies for mine, uh, is actually a rel relatively recent phenomenon because although she was known in several art circles, especially during her lifetime, it really wasn't until the 1980s when the first major Kahlo biography was published by the American art historian Hay uh, Hayden Herrera, excuse me, who was profiled in the documentary if you've been able to see it yet. That's the point at which Kahlo's uh, fame really began to soar. And then, of course, in 2002, there was released the biopic starring uh, Selma Hayek as Frida, and it brought this even bigger spotlight onto an artist who was by no means an unknown name during her lifetime, but also wasn't super prominent outside of select art world circles either. But now it's really practically a given that Frida Kahlo exhibitions just sell out all over the world. And there's this continually clamoring, uh, clamoring for events and programming about her. We just love her. And she's not really a cult figure anymore. I think she used to be, but now she's someone who's really widely beloved, if not revered by many people around the world. And she was truly one of the breakout stars of the Mexican modernist movement. So for many, I think there's something really relatable about Frida Kahlo and about her work. And that kind of relatability or interest that people have in her is one of the things that I wanna to talk to you about tonight. 
because I, I hope you have the chance if you haven't already to see the documentary. It is wonderful, but they go into such great detail on her biography and also about key works of art. So I wanted to really talk about the interest that has really grown about Frida Kahlo over these last couple of decades. And a lot of her relatability in particular directly stems from her biography. And I think we really can't often separate the two because her artwork and her life are so closely intertwined. And Kahlo also really visualized her life in paintings in such a blunt and emotional way. There's this honesty that is sometimes so jarring to so many people. And that's partially because several of Frida's paintings are sometimes shocking in their subject matter and sometimes even their gore or their ability to tackle something that might be seen as taboo or to even express herself in this very bare, unguarded way. Really perhaps unlike any artist, maybe except Van Gogh perhaps and possibly a few others, who had ever really done this to the same degree before. And this bluntness actually sometimes does turn people off. And I'm always thinking about my own mother here because she often talks to me about how uncomfortable Frida Kahlo's paintings make her. And I understand that completely. Uh, but the one thing you just can't dismiss is that her work, regardless, it makes you feel something. That might be discomfort, it might be joy, but it does make you feel something, sadness, anger, shock, surprise, sympathy, humor sometimes, and of course, even joy. A lot of us are very familiar with Frida's sort of origin story, especially when it comes to her work, but it bears repeating simply because it's not only such a formative moment in her biography, but it's also one of the most, form uh, excuse me, foremost elements that really makes her so relatable to so many. So briefly, in late 1925, when she was about 18 years old, Frida was riding a bus home from school when it collided spectacularly uh, with a streetcar and it killed, it was an accident that killed several people and seriously injured several more, including Frida herself. And in fact, her injuries were considered so severe that they were nearly fatal and it was not a given that she was actually going to survive this horrible accident. She had fractured ribs, a broken collarbone, both legs had significant fractures. And one of the most gruesome parts of her injuries was that a handrail impaled her through her pelvis and fractured her pelvis as well. So she spent a long time in the hospital recovering and both at the hospital and then further recovery time at home on bed rest. And the repercussions of such a significant accident would really haunt her for the rest of her life. And so to cope, she had an easel fashioned at her bedside so that she could pass the time basically occupying herself with art. And above the easel in the hospital room and also at home, she placed a mirror. And that was how Frida began creating some of her very first self-portraits, which is really a subject that she is most remembered for by many people today. And she continued to use this mirror over the bed method on and off through her lifetime. You can see in this image here that she has a mirror hanging up over her bed, but it was by no means the only way that she painted when she was incapacitated. This is a really interesting kind of contraption that she has above her bed so she could draw and paint uh, when she was ill later in her life. But this element of her learning and painting and having that mirror over her bed while she was recovering at a young age is still very critical because it was really at that point that Frida actively began to pursue art first as a hobby and then growing in seriousness towards her pursuit as a career, um, all through the lens of her own experiences. So it's not only a reflection of her biography, but also a way to work through her thoughts and her feelings about the events in her life. And to me, I think this really gives us these two arenas through which we can understand that element of the Frida mania, that Frida bears her soul. She reveals herself to us so intimately that we really feel like we know her and potentially understand her more than almost any other artist in the past hundred years. And secondly, it's also important to remember that Frida used her art as a refuge, as her therapy, 
because it really started as a way to cope with the struggles in her life, beginning, of course, first with that trolley and bus accident, but then also going further into her health issues and her inability to carry a baby, and of course, her personal relationships, so including but not limited to her very tumultuous long relationship with Diego Rivera. So art very much allowed her to explore what she may have felt was potentially unsayable to certain people. And as such, I think she gives many of us this similar permission to open up ourselves in some way and to potentially become more vulnerable too. Frida has also been adopted recently in the last, I'd say 50 years, especially as a strong feminist icon. And legions of women have really adopted her as their sort of personal saint due to her independence and her dedication to taking up space, so to speak, which grew increasingly important as the artist aged. So as a young adult, both before and after the accident, Frida was often shown, especially in images that her father, who was a photographer, took uh, wearing pants or more traditional so-called male dress. And as these amazing photos, I love these photos so much, uh, show her donning a men's suit. I just, I love these so much. Uh, so she had this early sense early on of really playing with the idea of her own femininity. And this performance was of great interest to her. And you'll see that in the documentary as well, if you've gotten the chance to watch that. So she was especially interested in the way that her clothing and her accessory choices could reflect her assertion of her personal identity at various points in her life. So here in 1939, you can see her that she's presenting herself as really a supporting figure as the little wife to her superstar artist husband. And then later on to a return to that men's suit that she loved when she was younger, paired here with her newly shorn hair as a way to symbolize her uh, independence from Diego Rivera following their separation. This wildly independent streak is, I think, very appealing about Kahlo. And her appearance is something that frequently bears that personality trait out. I'm thinking also in particular of the oft discussed physical attributes that I think are such a big part of that Frida Kahlo cosplay that we were talking about earlier, which is this uh, unibrow first and foremost, and then also the little wisp of a mustache, because both of these traits, I think to another woman, even possibly me, uh, would view these as beauty flaws, um, something that one would take great pains to omit from my self portraits, for example, but not Kahlo. And in fact, she often talked about purposefully accentuating these elements and she took great pride in contrasting them with things that she determined to be more feminine elements, such as her makeup, her face that was highlighted with these beautiful rouge cheeks and vibrant red lipstick and her intricate hairstyles and jewelry. She had this wonderful saying that she liked to say about her appearance, which was quote, of the opposite sex, I have the mustache and in general, the face, unquote. So she had this idea that she really enjoyed and it really embraced these so-called imperfections. And I think that has been extremely inspiring for many women even today and possibly especially today. So going back to that idea of active gender play, at least when it comes to Frida's appearance being an inspiration to many people today as well, um, I think there's also been a lot of interest in her because of that and the fact that more individuals these days are declaring themselves as being gender non-conforming or non-binary or gender fluid. And this is something that's been of interest recently as well because Frida, as it relates to her sexuality, because she was bisexual and she did have affairs with both men and women and in select circles during her lifetime, this was not a huge secret. Um, and even after her remarriage to Diego Rivera in 1940, she continued to have relationships with both men and women, just as Rivera continued to have relationships of his own. So many embrace Frida today as an icon of someone who didn't conform strictly to gender and sexual binaries and boundaries. And then I don't want to forget also the larger sense that Frida is so important to the Mexican community and the Mexican American and Mexican diaspora cultures 
around the world because she's been adopted for many as a symbol of Mexico, full stop. Um, she is this sensation, as many people call it, of Mexicanidad or so-called Mexicanness. And that is due to a number of factors, not the least of which is that she include a lot of symbolism about Mexico and her home. And as you can see in this painting here, one of her relatively uh, rare or still life paintings. And then she also referenced even her own home country in her materials occasionally as well, such as this early portrait that was done on tin that would have been a very rather recognizable riff on uh, the materials that were used often for ex voto paintings or retablos, which are a popular art form in Mexico. There's a wonderful part in the documentary where you see an artist actually creating retablos today. And it's really, really fantastic. It's still a popular art form. And it was a format that Diego also occasionally used as well. But more than that, this sensation of Mexicanidad was I think most fully expressed in Kahlo herself, or at least in the version of her identity that she most often presented to the world, to the out world. And I think especially after her marriage, the first time around to Diego Rivera, she chose very specifically to adopt a rather distinctive and very flamboyant wardrobe that was closely tied to her identity, both culturally and artistically, as well as politically. And early on, this was promoted and encouraged by her husband. And Diego Rivera once really forwardly wrote about this kind of cultural uh, dress and adaptation. And he wrote, quote, the Mexican people, the classic Mexican dress has been created for the many people by the people. The Mexican woman who does not wear it do not belong to the people, but are mentally and emotionally dependent on a foreign class to which they belong, i.e. the great American and French bureaucracies, unquote. So very targeted political statement there. But we can also see that Frida's you know, so-called adoption of Mexican wear uh, also stood in line with her own agreement in that political view and also uh, her own interest in Mexico's independence and cultural supremacy also. And of course, I think it also related specifically to her own proto-feminist views of having this very gender specific dress. For example, uh, she, like many people in the modern period, found great interest in indigenous and pre-Hispanic Mexican cultures, especially indigenous groups that were uh, especially at that time based in and around the Oaxaca area, because these groups and Oaxaca especially were seen as being more authentic because of, first of all, their more remote location, not based in uh, the metropolitan center of Mexico City, for example, but also because they managed to maintain much of their language and their cultural traditions long after the Spanish invasion hundreds of years earlier. In particular, Frida really loved and was drawn to the colorful and rich clothing of Tijuana women. And she admired them not only because of their stunning, beautiful apparel that you can see on the screen here, but she also admired the fact that Tijuana women tended to appear more independent than many other women in other traditional cultural groups. Um, so for example, they played a very prominent role in the marketplace so that sensation gave them a certain amount of power and thus uh, also money as well within the society, which was also tended to be a matriarchal society. And Kahlo was then able to channel or at least reference that kind of matriarchal power and feminine power uh, by very cautiously and clearly adopting these kind of outfits and making her own take on them. And I think one of the best examples of how this translated uh, from her clothing translated into her art is in paintings like this one, which is called Diego on my mind, self-portrait as a Tijuana from 1943. And you can see that she's adopted this really gorgeous Tijuana headdress called a resplendor that I think frames her face so beautifully. And as an added benefit, another element about these uh, skirts of the traditional Tijuana wear that she would adopt, these full dresses, is that it also actively camouflaged some of the disabilities that she experienced from a bout of polio that she had as a child that literally made one leg a little bit shorter than the other. 
and then also hid any of the devastating marks from the injuries from that accident that she suffered as a teenager. And so let me have a brief moment to just say that, did I mention that she's also been adopted as a muse and an icon for accessibility advocates too. Um, so during her lifetime, she was really seen as inhabiting this entire segment and section of Mexicanness, of Mexicanidad as it was called. And even her friends and loved ones actually really mentioned this when talking about her. Her friend, who was also a wonderful artist, Lola Alvarez Bravo, the photographer who you see here on the screen, she wrote about Frida, quote, she was like the birds and flowers and Mexican quilts all knotted together, a Mexican mood concentrated in an epic and all expressed through her, unquote. And this brings me to my final point about Frida Kahlo's uh, relevance today. In her lifetime, especially when she was traveling through the U.S. with Diego and she went from San Francisco to Detroit, and New York, she was flooded with attention. Unfortunately, not always for her artwork, much to her chagrin. And as you can see from this amazing headline of wife of master mural painter gleefully dabbles in works of art. But at the earlier point in her life, especially, she got a lot of attention because of her appearance. She came to San Francisco, especially in the beginning, dressed in her best Tijuana wear. And she was written about in all the newspapers. And she and Diego were really treated like celebrities wherever they went. And partially, this was due to Diego's fame, of course, but also due in no small part to what was seen as Kahlo's quote unquote exotic appearance. And this is something she did find pleasure in. During that first San Francisco trip in 1930, for example, she wrote a letter to her mother in which she wrote, quote, the gringas really like me a lot and pay close attention to all the dresses and rebosos, which is a, a kind of a large shawl that I brought with me. They're just dropping at the sight of my jade necklaces, unquote. So that fascination of, uh, with Frida's outward appearance has really never faded. And if anything, I think it's gotten so much stronger over the years. And even in her lifetime, she saw it grow and grow, especially mm -hmm. when the famed photographer, Nicholas Marai, who worked with outlets like Vanity Fair and Vogue magazine, took these incredibly stunning image of her um, at his New York studio and really captured her for one of the first times in this beautiful, vivid color photography. And I, I think most specifically about this image, which is called Frida Kahlo on bench number five, which to me is one of the most famous images that has ever been created of Kahlo. And it's also one where she almost looks like an icon herself. And it has really inspired devotion and emulation among generations of viewers. So from the clothing, to the makeup, to the fresh flowers that she would put in her hair, like you see in this image here, and her elaborate hairstyles, and the fact that she was so committed to making her appearance such an integral part of her life, her integrity, um, that even in the final years of her life, when she was so wracked with pain, um, and also was dealing with the recovery from multiple surgeries, she still pursued these two avenues, making herself up, making herself feel and look as beautiful as she wanted to, and painting. And for her, I think those two things may very well have gone hand in hand, especially when we consider the fact that almost a third of her paintings are self-portraits. So all of this to me essentially boils down to present Frida Kahlo to us today as a fashion icon also, whose exhibitions have started to feature not only her art, but in the last decade, they've started revealing more of her clothing or even reproductions of her clothing, as well as some of her actual cosmetics and favorite cosmetics brands that she would use. And fashion houses all over the world and publications all over the world have drawn inspirations from her for various seasonal lines and products. And you can also see these wonderful fashion spreads, these shoots that have taken up her as an icon again and as a starting point for riffs on her own very classic and recognizable look. So when we're considering all of these different facets and the many ways that people can appreciate and even identify in some ways with Frida Kahlo, 
I don't think it's any wonder that she has become so lauded by so many and that she is one of the most identifiable and recognizable artists in modern history. So to those of us like me, and unfortunately, who didn't get the chance to know Frida in life, she's been really transformed into a symbol uh, for better or for worse. So she's become a person whose own interest in playing with her identity allows us potentially the permission to play with our own identities uh, as women, as men, as people in the middle, as lovers and fighters, divorcees, as typical people, atypical people, fashionistas, feminists, artists, all of these different identities and interests are really funneled through the life and the work and the figure of this one person. And ultimately, I think what's really funny is that all of this idolization of Frida was probably one that she never could have predicted so fully, at least not from a personal point of view. And I don't think certainly from the interest in her artwork as well, because as she once said about her own paintings, quote, I think that they will at least interest a few people, unquote. So for Frida to be in this position where she is so recognizable and lauded by so many, I think it may have blown her mind. It would have been amazing.